Okay, we're going to discuss some basics and not so basics of CFT today. Uh, so, first, uh, some discussion of the symmetries. So, recall the generators of conformal symmetry um, are the vector, the vector field zeta. Uh, such that their action on the metric is proportional to the metric itself. So I'll write that as delta zeta g uh, is 2 sigma of x g mu nu. Um, and the action of a diffeomorphism in general is 2 times the symmetric derivative grad mu uh, zeta nu. Okay, so given a metric, we can define the conformal symmetries of that metric uh, by solving this equation for zeta. And those are the conformal symmetries. Um, so if you take g mu nu uh, equals eta mu nu, which is mostly what we mean when we're talking about conformal symmetry, um, then the uh, generators are Poincaré. Um, plus special conformal generators k mu, um, which I think I wrote before, but I'm not going to write again, um, plus the dilatation x mu d mu. And um, there are mo that's that's all of them in more than two dimensions. There are more in two dimensions, uh, which we'll come back to. Um, but we're just going to discuss the general, the general case today. Everything I'll say will also apply to two dimensions. But in two dimensions, you get more. OK. So each generator. Zeta uh, gives you a conserved charge. So let's call those conserved charges Q of zeta. The conserved charge is um, the integral uh, of some charge density over space. So I'm going to write that this way integral over space of d sigma mu t mu nu z nu. OK, so d sigma mu is the area element in space. Uh, we're going to have to pick a slice uh, that determines where this is being integrated. d sigma mu is is the area element, t mu nu is the stress tensor, and zeta is the uh, generator. So this thing here uh, is the conserved current associated to this symmetry. Conserved uh, means that if you do this calculation on one spatial slice, and then do this calculation on a different spatial slice in your space time, you're supposed to get the same answer. Um, so well, this is true as long as there's nothing funny happening between those two slices back to that. Often we like to insert operators there, and then it won't be true. Uh, but as long as there's nothing inserted there, conserved means that q evaluated on sigma 1 is equal to q evaluated on sigma 2. Uh, so delta q is an integral um, over the space um, so I'm going to. Is there a video from? No, it's 
not focus. Oh. You gotta focus. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's good. Um, okay, so I'm gonna subtract these two charges, and um, I'm gonna subtract the two charges and integrate by parts to write this as the integral over the, everything in between sigma one and sigma two. Um, and so that's integral d dx root g uh, t mu nu grad mu zeta nu, where I've just uh, integrated by parts. I've also used, OK, so I used integration by parts, and um, I used conservation of a stress tensor grad mu t mu nu equals zero uh, in order to write the derivative only acting on zeta. Now, uh, this term here, we said this is a conformal transformation, and we said that, well, first of all, I can, it's being contracted into the stress tensor, which is symmetric. So I'm free to replace this by a symmetric part. And now that's the formula for the Lie derivative of the metric. So I can plug that in. Uh, so this is equal to 2 sigma of x uh, g mu nu of x. Um, sorry, there's no 2 there. Uh, the 2, yeah. There's no two. It was, it was, there were twos on both sides of the equation. Okay. Um, okay, so this, uh, this delta Q is therefore the integral uh, d, dx root g t mu mu of x, that is the trace of the stress tensor, times sigma of x. And uh, we want that to be 0 in a conformal field theory, because we want the conformal charges to be conserved charges. So uh, what we see from this equation, this has to be true for, um, well, let me, let me say it a little differently. So it's pretty clear from this equation that we're going to have to take trace t to be 0, uh, because sigma can be various functions. It can't be, any, it can't be any function, but it can be various functions. And then we can um, make this, we can do these deformations locally. We can, we can just move our, our spatial slice a little bit. So this will basically just pick up trace t at a point. Um, let me go through that a little bit more slowly. Um, so, can I ask yeah. I'm just a little confused because I thought in writing that expression we already used the conformal symmetry, but now you're saying we're going to have to impose additional constraints on, on t mu nu. Um, no, well, so I would say that 
we're trying to rephrase conformal symmetry as a statement about T mu nu. Okay. Okay, so imposing conformal symmetry or, or asking if there's conformal symmetry is asking if this vanishes. And now we're gonna, we're gonna rephrase that as a statement about T. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's consider the dilatation. Take zeta to be just the rescaling, x mu d mu. Uh, so that corresponds to delta zeta of g mu nu uh, just being g mu nu, the rescaling. Um, so sigma is equal to a half. Um, and the dilatation charge d, which is defined to be q of the charge for this rescaling, q of x mu d mu, uh, is then 1 half integral d dx, uh, sorry, uh, delta, delta d um, is then 1 half integral d dx, uh, root g t mu mu. Uh, so for that to be zero, uh, it looks, from what I've done, it looks like this, this has therefore set t to zero, because we could deform that slice in just one little spot, like this could be our sigma, and then that could be our sigma one, and, and sigma two could just have it, have like a little bump there. Um, so that seems to imply the trace is zero. Let me say this almost implies t mu mu equals zero. Um, I'm going to come back to this. Let's put a couple stars next to this almost. It's not quite true. Uh, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, well, this equation definitely requires t mu to be zero, but the point is that t itself is ambiguous. There, you can you can sometimes improve the stress tensor and write a slightly different stress tensor for the same theory. Um, and what we're really interested in is whether a theory can be improved to be conformally invariant. Because if you could find any conformally invariant stress tensor, the theory counts as conformal. Or any, if you can find any traceless stress tensor, it'll count. Okay, so that's why the almost, but we're going to come back to that. Um, so in this case, so if it's traceless, um, then all of the other conformal charges are automatically conserved. Okay, so uh, conformal invariance is the statement that t mu mu is equal to zero. And what we've seen is that uh, this almost follows from scale invariance. Just in having the dilatation is almost enough. As I said last time, it's basically locality. If you have, if you have a, a, a local theory that's scale invariant, then it sort of has to be locally scale invariant and uh, becomes conformal invariant. curve space, this is just a matter of terminology, a, a, CMP, a CFT in curve space is often 
not conformal. Um, because of the anomaly, which we'll talk about. Um, so, yeah. Oh, can I see the... Sorry, yeah. Why are you calling it a CFT then? Yeah, that's the fine print, but it's still called, it's still called a CFT. Just, it's just terminology. So, like if we, if we take a, so a CFT has no scale. But if you take a theory with no scale and you put it on a, on a cylinder of, of radius one meter, well, guess what? Now it has a scale. Okay, but we still call it a CFT. And it inherits a lot of, uh, a lot of properties from the, from the CFT. Um, and we'll see examples of that. Um, so, for example, if, well, let me, let me say that the confusion that this always causes, okay, we often talk about the um, spectrum, we often talk about the energies of a CFT, and if you take a CFT on a sphere, so if you, if you take a CFT on time times a sphere of radius r, um, then the CFT has a discrete spectrum of energy levels, and therefore it has it has numbers with units associated to it. Okay, but the the fact that it's a CFT means that um, only it, all those numbers will be determined by the size of the sphere. Um, so the energy levels of this theory uh, will all go as one over r because that sets the units. And that would be the, the only way that, that, that they depend on R. Will we be interested in those sorts of CFTs in this time? Sorry? Will we be interested in those sorts of CFTs that are, that are on your geometry? Yes. Scale? Okay. Yes. Yes. In fact, we're pretty much always interested in, in, in this kind of in CFTs like this. Um, because even if all you care about is CFTs on the plane, it's really useful to, the, we'll see in a minute, you can conformally map to this, and then, uh, then you can think about things on, on this geometry, and it's often useful to do that. So, it's a, yeah. Okay, the, the next comment is, um, I need to tell you about operator equations. Okay, so equations like this, stress tensor is conserved, or the stress tensor is traceless. These are called operator equations. Because those aren't numbers, those are operators. They're not fields, they're not numbers. Um, they're really operators. And an operator equation, so what does an operator equation actually mean? It does not mean that the right-hand side is zero. It's a fake. <laughs> this is not what operator equations mean. It means that it's zero away from coincident points inside correlation functions. Let me say it again. It means that it's, it's zero as long as this operator doesn't bump into any other operators. But it's very much not zero when it bumps into other operators. Okay, so um, this one, the, the second one, for example, means t mu mu of x o of y1 o of y2 dot 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 um, is equal to zero plus um, a sum of terms with a delta function uh, of x hitting the other points. Okay. Correlation functions are not really functions, they're, they're distributions. The physical things are what you get when you take correlation functions and you integrate them against stuff. 
just like the, the meaning of a delta function is what you get when you integrate it. Okay, and that this is like times other stuff. So there can be there can be single delta functions, there can be multiple delta functions. These delta functions are going to be important. These things are called contact terms. No? Yeah. Is that correlation function like a Euclidean correlation function? Or that's what I had in mind, but I don't think it matters. Um, because if it were Lorentzian, I would think that it would be about light cones instead of about. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. Let's let's say this is a Euclidean statement. Um, the, otherwise, we have to be more careful about what these delta functions mean. Yeah. Yeah. Is that um, correlation happening at a vacuum or some other state, any state of theory? Um, good. This is a statement about the, this is a vacuum correlation function. Okay. So anytime I write the brackets without saying otherwise, it's a, vac it's a vacuum correlation function. And it, that's gonna matter because like, you know, one way we can make a state is by acting with an operator on vacuum. Okay, so if, if you make a state by acting with an operator on vacuum, then this trace t can also pick up contributions from, from hitting that operator. Uh, so there are additional contributions from, from the state. Okay. Yeah. One more question. This is not special about CFTs. Right. This, this is, is not special about CFTs. Theory That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so this equation has a, it means a similar thing. And there's delta functions that are important in, in any theory. Um, the, the fact that the trace vanishes, this is, this is special to CFT. So are you still in flat space, or are you considering CFTs on a curve space when you write this? Um, let's see. Well, I mean, in curved space, this equation may or may not be true. Yeah. If it's true, then it, this is what it means. If when the, when this if this equation is true, if, it means that it means that this is what it means by definition. Now, the fact that it's traceless may or may not a, a CFT may or may not be have a traceless stress sensor in, in curved space. I mean, there might also be some factor of square root g because delta function is not. It says time stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, for example, like if we calculate um, back to our definition of conservation, we said that if you calculate some charge on two different spatial surfaces, then they should agree. Uh, but if you have an operator inserted here, O of y, uh, then um, the, the charges will not agree. So q of zeta on sigma 1 will not be equal to q of zeta on sigma 2. Um, because of the due to contact term in um, T O, uh, when you try to write down the integral, uh, remember it became, we integrated by parts and became an integral over this region. Uh, but now, now you're going to pick up a delta function when it hits this operator. And in fact, the, um, 
the contact term will be fixed by the symmetry. So um, you're going to work this out on the homework, which, by the way, is posted. Um, so the 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 charge gen the charge generates the symmetry when acting on the operator. Okay, and the way it does that is through this delta function. Right, the 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 charge when it passes through the operator, it generates the conformal transformation through the delta function. And so that's, so the delta function is not only there, the delta function is crucial to the, it's the whole, it's uh, crucial to the action of the symmetry, and its coefficient is gonna be fixed by the symmetry. And uh, so that's called the word identity, and, um, you're going to work out one or two of those on the homework. Okay, now I'm going to digress for a few minutes. And I'm going to call this an aside because I think if you have never really seen conformal field theory before, you should probably ignore me for a few minutes. Um, but you can listen to the gist of it. I want to discuss the difference between scale, the problem of scale versus conformal symmetry. Okay, this is going back to that almost that we had a few minutes ago. So the way I gave you that argument, it looked like uh, it looked like requiring scale invariance would actually imply tracelessness of the stress tensor and therefore automatically give you conformal invariance. And I, now that's not quite true, and I'm going to, well, it might be true. It might be true, actually, but it's unproven, and I want to discuss what the, what the issue is and what the situation is. Okay, so why almost? Um, the issue is the improvement terms. So if, if the trace of t is a divergence of something, so if trace t is the divergence of v, um, then the so-called improved dilatation current, which is defined this way, JD mu is uh, T mu nu x nu minus V mu. Okay, this is a nu. Okay, so remember we're, we're dotting it into the generator. Okay, so the first thing is the thing I was using as a conserved current when we discussed it before. T dotted into the generator. Um, and now we're improving it by adding this V. And the reason that's improving it is because this is conserved. Um, for scale invariance. You don't need the stress tensor to actually be traceless. You just need it to be a total divergence. And then you can find an action of the dilatation. Um, now, it could be that we can also, maybe it's, so now the question is, is it also conformal? Um, well, you can show the following. Um, if V is also a total derivative, so V mu is grad nu L mu nu, um, then the conformal currents Can, 
can be improved. And you get a conformal field theory. So the conclusion um, is the following. If both trace t is equal to grab mu v mu and v mu is equal to grad nu v mu nu. Sorry, is not equal to, to, to a total divert. Sorry, L. That's an L. So if T is a total divergence, but V is not a total divergence, um, then uh, the theory is scale invariant but not conformally invariant. Was there a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you modified the current by subtracting this term. Yeah. Um, does that mean that you're also changing what the transformation is? It does. Yeah. So I was about to mention that. Um, So this thing, v, v mu, is, is called the virial current. And uh, the way you can think of it is just the way that you have in mind. It's, it's an internal, it's, you should view this as the internal part of a scale transformation. OK, so if you just rescale and do nothing else, the theory is not invariant. But if you rescale and do some internal uh, action on the fields, which is generated by V, then it's invariant under that. And for the purposes of like, you know, finding constraints on correlators and stuff like that, that's just as good. So that still counts as being a scale invariant, uh, a scale invariant field theory. Um, now, if you could find situations like this, you would have theories that are scale invariant but not conformally invariant. And this would kind of mess up our paradigm. Okay, Remember the, the, the paradigm from last time was that uh, when, you have, when you have quantum field theories that are well-defined at all scales, uh, we believe that they're conformal in the infrared and the UV. Uh, this would be, be counterexamples to that. This would be theories that are scale but not conformal. So why doesn't this happen? This, this basically almost never happens. Um, and under a little bit of extra assumption, it really never happens. So why is that? Well, um, the scaling dimension of the stress tensor, the, the mass dimension of the stress tensor, is exactly d in d dimensions. This is exact uh, because of the conservation of the stress tensor. Um, so in order, um, for t, in order for t to be a total divergence, um, you would need an operator v, a vector operator v with dimension exactly d minus 1. And you want this operator to, you want this current, you want the virial current alone to not be conserved. OK. Now, if you have conserved currents in a conformal field theory, then the conservation law fixes their dimension to be exactly d minus 1. Uh, but if, if it's not conserved, then typically current vector operators pick up anomalous dimensions. So um, basically, there are just never any operators that can do this. There, there are basically never any, even any candidates that you can write down that might be the virial, the virial current. So typically, 
no such operator. And in fact, it's proven not to exist in some cases. So in, in two dimensions, um, you could prove that there can never be an operator like this. This was by Polchinski. Um, and it's also proven in four dimensions, but slightly less proven. Okay, so in, in four dimensions, the, there are, there's a solid proof in uh, perturbation theory. And there's a not so solid proof that's non perturbative. Uh, but that question is still open. Yeah, that happens. So, so like for example, if you just take the, um, if you just take a massless scalar field, um, and you write down the standard energy momentum tensor for a massless scalar field, um, this is actually basically what you'll 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 find that it's not traceless, but that it can be improved to be traceless. Um, so. When we talk about free fields as a CFT, we're always we always have in mind implicitly using the improved stress tensor. Um, but if you like accidentally wrote down the one that was not improved, then you could go through this procedure and and you'd find a real current, and but then you would find the real real current was itself a divergence, and then you could improve things back to a CFT. Okay, the, the example that's sort of as close as they come to being scale but not conformal is, at least that I'm aware of, is a three dimensional maximum. That is just three gauge fields in three dimensions. And in fact, uh, three dimensional Maxwell fields are, um, let's see, sorry. Uh, These are irrelevant? No. Okay, I can't, I'm, I'm getting mixed up about whether if you add particles, it flows to this and the UV or the IR, one of those. Okay, so um, let's just talk about free Maxwell fields in three dimensions. Um, this is scale invariant. By the definition, uh, that we've been using, um, but it's not a CFT. But this is a very weird example. And the reason it's weird, um, and actually, I, I think a lot of people would say it's not really scale invariant for the following reason. The, the virial current in this theory, V mu, uh, is proportional to um, A nu, F mu nu, where A is the vector potential if F is the, F is the field string. And this is not gauge invariant. Okay? So uh, J mu D, the dilatation current, is not gauge invariant. Um, so this is not a physical operator. But uh, the dilatation charge, D, is gauge invariant. OK, so um, the interpretation is that if you just think about the, if you think about the, if you think about things globally, like you think about the Hilbert space, 
um, of states in this theory, then it does have a scale symmetry. It does, the states and stuff transform. This, this D is a perfectly good gauge invariant um, conserved charge. Uh, but it's not related, it's not really the integral of a local current. And um, that's a really weird kind of symmetry. I think some people would say that doesn't count. So this isn't really a symmetry, so it's not really scale invariant. Um, but it's just a matter of definitions. We can count it or not count it. Yeah. That's really confusing. Um, is, is there like an intuitive way to see like how that could be the case, like the behavior of the Green's function? And how, one dimension. how what could be the case? That you have a charge that is gauge invariant, but it's not associated to like a local, an integral over, over a, a local current. Um, do you want some other way to, to or you want, you want some feel for like, what's the deal with that? Is yeah. that what you're asking for? Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's like a, I, okay, I don't know. I don't know a good answer to that question. Um, I think there's probably a better answer than the one I'm about to give, but I'll, I'll give you the way I think about it, which I'm only 93% sure is correct. So usually when you have a symmetry, um, you can, it's easy to tell if it's, like if you're an observer, if, if you're a person in a theory with a symmetry, um, it's, fairly easy to, to detect where the symmetry is being violated um, and to, to calculate the charge of a state. Like you just walk around and you like count and you measure all the conserved charges and then you add them up. So there's something very local about the usual symmetries that we talk about. Um, and that's what I mean by easy. It's like, it's easy in the sense of, in the sense of like, Really means local that you can you can just add up the charges everywhere and that gives you the charge. This is a case where that doesn't hold. Okay, so there is a there is a conservation law, but it's a weird non-local conservation law. And if you lived in this theory, the only way to un, to like check if charge was conserved or not would be to like if you were like some super global meta observer who could see everything at once. That's just not usually what we mean by a symmetry. Um, so it's, yeah, I don't know if it, I don't know if we should count for that. That's that's why. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like a global symmetry. It's just like some sort of. Or is it a global? Well, it is a global symmetry. It is a global symmetry. But I think it's a bit like. Um, it's 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 sort of a stupid symmetry. Okay. So um, let me. I, here's a, another. Um, Here's another stupid symmetry. Okay, so this this symmetry, this operator, is the projector under the twelfth eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. This is this is this commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay, but it's not a symmetry in the in so in when we talk about symmetries in quantum field theory, we are not talking about stuff like this. Uh, this is symmetry of every, in, in this sense, this is a symmetry of every theory. But that, that's not what we mean by symmetry. Um, it's not, it's something that commutes with the Hamiltonian, but uh, the symmetries that we, that we usually talk about because they're useful are the symmetries that are, that are, that are built out of a local current. Um, and now, the dilatation might be slightly less stupid than this one, uh, because at least it has this, at least I can write down a, a non-gauge invariant current. Um, maybe it's somewhere in between. Yeah. Are the, um, the scale transformations corresponding to this dilatation still like arbitrary sigma max instead of just a global sigma? Are they still what? The, oh no, no. The scale transformations scale in scale transformations sigma is equal to a half. Oh okay. Right. It's not not conformal. This theory doesn't have conformal transformations. It only has the scale transformation. So it's not um, your 
you're changing the scale of space by the same amount everywhere. It's not like a local. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, um, yeah. So in all those theories where there is scale invariance but not conformal invariance, it means that the viral current is non-local. Is, is that a true? Um, do you mean in, in known examples, or what do you, what do you mean exactly? But, uh, from that statement, because uh, when you usually prove unitarity bonds, uh, you say for uh, if there are if the if that current was local, then these two would imply each other, right? That the scaling dimension is d minus one, and it is the fact that it is conserved. Are you using conformal symmetry when you say that? Uh, so do we use that when we prove the unitarity? Uh, I think you might be using the formal symmetry. I see. Yeah. Uh, let's think about it after. I think you might be using the formal symmetry. Yeah. The inverse, of, but the inverse of the statement is definitely true. What's it's, the, the what? What the inverse, inverse of the statement was if you have a global symmetry, then this happens. This can happen. What can happen? I mean, his statement was that um, whenever you have a problem like this, then it implies that D is a global symmetry. I'm asking the opposite, the inverse. OK, I don't really, I don't think I get it. But <laughs> I don't know, I'll ask you a question. OK. Um, OK, so I, I think it's uh, plausible or even likely um, that any theory with a scale current, with a with a with a true scale current, a physical scale current, which is gauge inver a gauge invariant operator, um, is is conform. As, as far as I know, there there I don't think there are any counterexamples to that, and uh, I mean that in all in all dimensions. People have worked really hard to prove for like 40 plus years, and um, you know, they they succeeded pretty quickly in two dimensions, and have like a, a pretty good strategy that doesn't quite work in four dimensions, and still don't have proof. So I don't know. Maybe it's not true. I don't know if that counts as evidence against it. What's probably, special probably about not. Um, the conformal anomaly is, so what's special about you know, even dimensions, you have a conformal anomaly, which, which gives you wonderful things that you can do with a stress tensor, and it enters the argument in both cases. So what's special about two is the conformal anomaly plus Virasoro, the extra conformal symmetry. In four, you have the conformal anomaly, but you don't have the extra symmetry. So, like six? In six, you have a conformal anomaly, um, but nobody has... Uh, got nobody has managed to make it work. Uh, the, it, so good. There, well, this connects to a whole other subject, which is the subject of C theorems, which um, I don't know if I'm going to talk about. But um, it's sort of there, there's another. Well, let me let me let me say what the connection is. Okay, so there's a. Uh, another closely related plausible thing, which is that um, that there's a number assigned to all conformal field theories, uh, which decreases under our G flow. So what that would mean is that, for example, you can never get like once you flow from UV to IR. You can't like then flow over here and then like flow back to this one. So, so it's believed that that RG flow is a one-way street, uh, and the, this is this is captured by what's called a C theorem. Okay, in two dimensions, there's a C theorem that says that 
there's this number C, which we are going to talk about, so, and, and C has to decrease under our G flow. Uh, in four dimensions, there's a C theorem, which is called the A theorem, um, which says that A has to decrease under our G flow. And the, the proofs, the, the proof, the, the way you prove these things about the variable current is, is closely related to proofs of the C theorem. We only have C theorems in two and four dimensions. Um, we, don't, we don't know if that's a technical thing or, or what, but we don't have counterexamples in any dimensions, including above four. Um, I don't know. It's a very mysterious subject because there are all these wrong things you can say about why there should be C theorems. And they're all very intuitive and they're all very wrong. But then you like actually check if they you so you motivate it with these wrong statements and then you actually check and it and, and it works. <laughs> so, it's weird. Uh, Tom? Yeah. The fact that uh, you can express a conserved charge as the integral of a like a not gauge invariant current is also true for Maxwell theory in four dimensions, right? Because the canonical stress tensor that you write down using Noether's theorem is not, I think, is not neither symmetric nor uh, gauge invariant. Then you add a total derivative term to make it uh, symmetric and gauge invariant. Okay. Um, let's see. So you're saying it's also scale but not conformal? No, no, no. I'm not talking about dilatation charge there. I'm just oh, talking about uh, uh, the stress tensor of Ma Maxwell theory in four dimensions. You're saying the stress tensor is already not gauge invariant? Yeah, when, once you add the total derivative term, it becomes gauge invariant. Oh, but you can improve it to something gauge. You can yeah, you can you improve, can improve it, it to something gauge invariant. Yeah. yeah. But, but that's sort of good enough. Yeah. No, but, uh, but the, the addition does not change the uh, charge. Right. So that means you can uh, also express this charge as the integral of a not gauge invariant current. Okay, but you can express it in terms of a gauge invariant one. That's the important oh, you thing. Can, you can in, in this case of 3D Maxwell, you cannot write it as the integral of a gauge invariant operator. I mean, if you can write it as something gauge invariant, then you should. But the question, but sometimes you can only write it as something that's not gauge invariant. Okay, the aside is declare the aside over. We're now back on. Our main path. Okay. So operators. Um, I'll mostly talk about scalar operators and stress tensors. Just to, uh, I'll, I'll I'll stick with scalars for now, and we'll go to um, stress tensors when we need them. But uh, O of X is called primary if. Uh, it has a, if it's a, if it has a nice uh, eigenvalue under dilatations. And we act with the dilatation on O of zero, uh, it just gets multiplied by delta. This eigenvalue uh, is the scaling dimension, and that's going to be the mass dimension of this field. That's one requirement. The other requirement uh, is that it's annihilated by the special conformal generators. finite version of this statement. This is like an infinitesimal dil is a question? Yeah. The, the, the brackets are, are there to, um, because it's an operator equation so we can understand it inside a um, correlator or, or why do you have the brackets? Yeah, this is how charges act on operators. Um, like, oh, never mind. Okay, yeah, okay. It's an operator, yeah. yeah. 
So uh, the final version of this is that under x goes to lambda x. Um, o of x goes to lambda delta O of lambda x. Uh, in other words, if I have a bunch of correlation functions of O of x's, I can plug this in instead. I can transform all of them to this, and the answer is unchanged. Uh, for, that's for the scale transformation. For general conformal transformations, um, and I have an admission, uh, admission to make here, which is I always get confused where the primes go. <laughs> and I tried really hard to get the primes right. I hope I got it. Um, <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time, <laughs> and I cannot get the primes in the right places. Okay. Um, I swear, every time I do it, I have to like open up the Francesco. I have well, <laughs> that's what I do. It. No, if you if you think about if you think about it in correlation functions, it's much easier. And I'll tell you what I mean by that when when we get to correlation functions. So maybe we'll even we can check some of my primes when we get to correlation functions. Um, so if if you have a, a a conformal transformation, x goes to x prime. Uh, the fact that it's conformal means that g mu nu prime of x is equal to um, omega of x squared g mu nu of x. That's what it means to be a conformal transformation. Notice that this is not g mu nu prime of x prime. That would be a tensor, tra that would be a, the, the um, tensor transformation of the law. Um, it's g mu nu prime of x, okay? Um, so this associates to any conformal transformation, it associates a, a conformal factor omega. And um, under this conformal transformation, O of x goes to um, omega of x to the minus delta um, o of x prime. I'm afraid, wait, I think I already messed up my, <laughs> that's prime. Yeah. But not in the top one. Not in, not in this one, right. Yeah. Okay, honestly, the only way to get the primes is to plug it into the two point function and make sure it makes sense. <laughs> So as far as correlation functions, um, this means that if you have a correlation function, O1 of x1, O2 of x2, dot, 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 then uh, this is equal to omega of x1 prime to the minus delta 1, omega of x2 prime to the minus delta 2, um, times the correlation function O1 at the prime, O at the primes. Spinning operators, uh, 
I don't think we're really going to use this, but let me write it down. Um, so let me write it this way. If we have if we have a conformal transformation f of x, um, then the Jacobian d f mu of x dx nu um, is the conformal factor times um, a Lorentz transformation. Okay, so there's some, so to a given conformal transformation, there's associated both a uh, both a, a scale factor and a Lorentz transformation. And so when we um, do conformal transformations on spinning operators, we have to work, we have to worry about the, the action of Lorentz. Okay, so on a spinning operator, um, we take O mu prime of x. Uh, well, this is this is say we have an operator with one index, then uh, omu prime of x is uh, omega of x prime to the minus delta r mu nu of x prime o nu of x prime. So basically, this part of it acts like the tensor transformation law, and then you have to also stick in the conformal factor. Um, note that uh, in all this discussion of conformal transformations, the, the manifold is, is unchanged. Okay? So like if we, were, if we were keeping track of the metric, or the, if we were keeping track of the Lie element, this would be would be s squared, d s squared. These are all these are all in the same theory on the same metric. So these are only diffuse and not well transmitted. Um, well, they're. They're, um, they're wild transformations which are diffuse. Some wild transformations are diffuse, and those are the conformal transformations. So I thought wild transformations was changing the line element, right? Um, or that's, is that not? I mean, you're not changing the chord, you're not transforming the chord. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, it it sort of depends what you mean. If if you do a so, if you take a, if you do a vial transformation, you change a line element. Yeah. Um, but say I say I do the rescaling. Okay. So I, I start out with a metric. Say I'm in one dimension. The metric is dx squared. X is my coordinate. Yeah. Um, and I do the vial transformation. That corresponds to the rescale. Uh, well, then I can absorb that into a, a diff, um, and this allows me to relate vial transformations to conformal transformations. So it's true they're interpreted a little different, but but they basically do the same thing. If 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 the vial transformation that you do can be absorbed into a diff. Then you can reinterpret it as a conformal transformation. But the point is, if if I'm changing the line element between two points, I'm actually changing the distance between the points, right? So yeah, but we move. But, but when we do this, we move the operators. Uh, and we're gonna and you move them in just the way to compensate yeah, the fact you're that you change the, the line. Yeah, moving but still the the physical distance between them doesn't change. Um, I thought that was the definition of. 
That was the definition of what? A diffio. But a while transformation actually changes the distance between or between all. Yeah, uh, let me come back. Let me come back to this with all the primes in the right places. I want to write down vials, but I don't have my primes ready to like be able to do it correctly. Um, so the conformal transformations uh, fix a lot about the theory. Uh, they fix the two-point functions. Um, well, let me write it for two operators, O1 and O2. So they fix the two-point function. Uh, this is zero if the scaling dimensions are different. And this is uh, C12 over x1 minus x2 to the 2 delta if they're the same. What we usually do, um, although not always, what we usually do is we pick a basis of operators that diagonalizes the two-point functions. Um, so that this becomes uh, just a, a delta ij for the two-point function of two operators. So you, that involves rescaling the operators and maybe rotating them in a way that diagonalizes this two-point function. Um, so when I said primes are tricky and just you always have to check everything on the, on the correlation function, this is what I meant. Um, so if you're confused about where your lambdas and primes and whatnot go, just make sure that this is true. Okay, so like for example, um, if, we, if we go back to the transformation rule that I wrote, then hopefully I wrote it um, in a way that um, that this would be true. That's one of those conformal transformations. That's the that's the scale transformation um, that I had up. Hopefully, if I have my primes in the right place. I'm sorry. How does that come from this? Uh, well. I'm, how, do, how does what, how does that? No, th this is the transformation rule that um, I that I stated a few minutes ago. Right. Um, and are you asking how this follows from it? I guess so. I'm just like when, when, when you say that that now you can check that the primes are in the right places. Ah, well I let's let's just check that it's true. Okay. okay. So so if we take the two point function and we rescale by we rescale x and y by lambda, then that gives us a lambda to the minus 2 delta. Uh, and so to make it invariant, you need a lambda to the 2 delta. Got it. OK, so everything's working. OK. That's all I mean. um, OK, another question is how you, how you derive this uh, from conformal transformations. Actually, the dilatation is not enough. Um, or Wait, is it enough for the two-point function? No, no, it's not enough. It's not enough. You need the special conformal transformations to, to derive this. Um, I mean, dilatation would only say, I think it is to the uh, delta 1 plus delta 2. It won't say that. That's right, yeah. 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 OK, they, the conformal transformations also almost entirely fix the three-point functions. Um, so on the right-hand side of the three-point function is a constant, C123, over um, something that's going to look like a mess, but it's basically just dictated by scale transformations. x1 minus x2 to the delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3, x2 minus x3, well, then just times the cyclic versions of that x2 minus x3 to the delta 2 plus delta 3 minus delta 1, x3 minus x1 to the delta 3 plus delta 1 minus delta 2.
these two facts are where a lot of the power of conformal field theory enters. The fact that um, the two-point functions and three-point functions, uh, which in a general quantum field theory, two-point functions and three-point functions are like terrible functions that are functions of all the coordinates that you have no idea how to calculate. And now that's been reduced just to this one number. Well, not one number. We also have, we, we need the scaling dimensions too, uh, but a couple of numbers. So these numbers are very important. These are called OPE coefficients. Um, and in fact, um, that's the whole data of the CFT, almost. So uh, basically, conformal field theory in uh, Euclidean flat space is exactly a list of scaling dimensions, delta 1, delta 2, etc and OPE coefficients, C, I, J, K. Uh, really, I should say, and spins, OK? Um, so let me say L, L1, delta 1, no. spins. Actually, this is completely true in two dimensions, and it's almost, it's, if, if all you care about are the correlation functions of local operators, it's also true in higher dimensions. Uh, but there's other stuff in a conformal field theory besides the local operators uh, above, above two dimensions. So there's also non-local data in d greater than two. And as far as I'm aware, nobody has really like, even said what the complete specification of a CFT is in, in more than two dimensions. What data would you need to provide? Um, I'll give a very quick, rough idea for why this is true. Because notice, I didn't say anything about four-point functions. All you need is the two-point functions and the three-point functions. And in principle, you're done. You know everything there is to know about this theory. And the reason for that is, is that if you have higher point functions, then you can do scale transformations where you bring these points together. You can use the three point functions. So you can, you can bring them together and then use the three point functions to replace these by a, by a new operator or new, by a sum of, of operators. And so that brings these that brings these in, and you get a, a sum of OI here. Uh, and now you've reduced this four-point function to a three-point function, and you can keep doing that because of conformal symmetry. Now, it's not true that you can give any old list of scaling dimensions and OP coefficients. Typically, if I just hand you a list of numbers, um, that won't correspond to any conformal field theory because it won't, uh, it won't act right when you try to do this procedure on it. And this is a starting point for what's called the bootstrap. So the idea of the bootstrap is to uh, do this procedure over and over again and um, try to figure out what kinds of dimensions and OP coefficients satisfy the, all the consistency conditions. Yeah? Why can't you bring three-point functions to two-point functions by scaling and getting two little points 
Um, yeah, kind of seems from my picture, it kind of seems like that would be possible, doesn't it? What was the question? Well, relatedly, why did you say that when you brought the first two together, you said we needed the three-point function to replace that with an operator? Yeah, because it's that's what the three-point function tells you what you should replace these by when you bring them together. Because, like the three, think of the three-point function as measuring the overlap of two operators with the third operator. So that's what tells you if if these are near each other. It tells you how much of that third operator you can will appear here. So in that case, isn't isn't that the answer to the question? Like you can't. You can't get away with just knowing the, the two-point functions because even if you tried to, even if you had three and tried to bring two together, you would need to know the data of the three-point. Oh functions. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Is it an assumption that the OIs form a basis for like the products of OIs at the same point? Um, is it an assumption? No, it's not an assumption. It's it's a fact. Um, now, the, there's the issue that I, I only so far talked about primary operators. I'm about to say what a descendant operator is, but it's a conformal transformation acting on a primary. And it's the fact that all operators are either primaries or descendants. But if you know, just like always when you have a symmetry, if you know the, if you know the properties of the primaries, then the properties of the descendants will all come from acting with the symmetries on it. Um, we'll stop here for now.